Thanks, Nora. That's always still weird for me to hear Dr. Jesse Baker. Um, this is pretty awesome. I, you don't get an opportunity too often to really explore something different. And um, when I was asked to help put this panel together, I, I didn't want to do kind of the same old, same old. And, and I don't know about you guys. I mean, I, this is an undergraduate class, so maybe you guys haven't been looking at sustainability as much as I have. But um, I go to a lot of conferences. I go to a lot of different meetings um, and talk to a lot of people about sustainability. And within the business sector, you tend to hear a lot of the same themes over and over and over and over and over again. And I think that it gets a little bit boring. <laughs> And so I wanted to do something a little bit different. And we have some really exciting panelists tonight. Um, all of them are doing something pretty progressive, at least in my eyes. And I've worked with, I was going to say 75%, but one of the guys apparently isn't showing up. Um, so now I'm going to say 66.6% .6 of the people here. But the other 33.3%, I've read their, or their presentation tonight, and it's really cool. And you guys have an opportunity to hear something that, that you're not going to hear too often when people are talking about business and sustainability. And what I'm gonna focus on, as you see here, is ethics and innovation. We do hear about innovation, but what we don't hear is sometimes how innovation can be problematic and how we manage that innovation. Um, I guess you guys should probably just come up now. That we don't have to do a full one-off, like, and introducing, you know, so. Um, we have, tonight we have, so Matt Perez here, and uh, Mike, and if you want to, I mean, you can come up here, but we certainly don't have to. Um, Matt Perez is the executive director, or executive chef at Duke's in Huntington Beach. I'm sure you guys have heard of that awesome restaurant. We work together on a uh, sustainable restaurant program. Um, Malta Key on the very end there. He and I have worked also with Matt on doing some energy efficiency, and Mo and I have collaborated on a couple of projects working with hotels and sustainability in the. Um, uh, hospitality industry. And then we have Sustainability Council Incorporated here, who I know that uh, Nora and Professor Matthew have talked with a number of times. And they're, all three of these guys are local, um, Irvine, Orange County based uh, businesses. So it's going to be interesting to get their perspective. Um, we haven't talked a whole lot specifically about the evening. What I did is I said, look, here's the deal. Uh, if you guys could come, try and focus your talk around ethics and innovation, some of the challenges that you guys have faced, the experiences that you guys have had, and, and just provide some of your personal insights. And as a little preamble to that, I think it would be appropriate if I did the same. When I graduated, I, I didn't really want to go into academia, and I had thought about going into the business world, and, and but what I really wanted to do is push kind of our own thought and, pro and idea of what the, the people that I founded this nonprofit organization with that we shared regarding sustainability. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. I'm surprised at how quick we were able to get that. And what we're committed to is finding and implementing comprehensive sustainability plans. And we believe that sustainability should be promoted as a social movement based on an ethical imperative rather than return on investment. Now, that doesn't mean I think we should discount return on investment. That's a very important aspect of sustainability and sustainability planning. But that, in my view, should fall under the grander umbrella term of sustainability. It's one component. I've worked with several companies. They are all more than happy to have me tell them where they can save money that allows them to also tout being green. Not very many of them are very interested in hearing where they have to spend money, right? So that poses some challenges in terms of finding value, but um, these panelists are gonna help enlighten us a little bit about what they do to address that. I do believe, as probably most of you, that the business sector has become the strongest driver of sustainability. Um, business is a reality. Economic development is a reality, and it's a reality that I believe in. And, and I imagine that most of you have seen something, if not this exact quote from that was in the Harvard Business Review, that if businesses aren't going to address sustainability, they're going to fall behind. And I liken it to very similar to the tech boom that happened maybe 10, 12 years ago. If any of you remember that, I don't know. But <laughs> there was a lot of speculation about technology and the Internet and, and information technological development. The companies that embrace that are the companies that succeeded. Companies that push it to the side failed. I think we're at a very similar opportunity right now. 
There's a conference going on right now in San Diego. It's called the Sustainable Brands Conference. And I think that the folks from Sustainability Council went. I went last Monday. Um, I've been paying close attention to it. Unfortunately, I can't go because it costs $1,500 to go. And a nonprofit organization really shouldn't put that in their budget and be able to get it past their uh, board of directors unless they have a whole bunch of money and we don't have that. So that puts nonprofits and uh, and students in academia at a disadvantage. We get a 20% discount, but that still kind of prices us out. So that's something to kind of put in the back of your mind when you think about who is it that's driving sustainability. At any rate, in doing the research on this uh, this conference, there was an article by Hunter Lovins. Um, I'm tempted to ask if anyone's heard of Hunter Lovins, but I imagine I'll get very few hands in the air. She is the widow of Amory Lovins, who is obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, very well known in terms of driving sustainability. And she founded the um, Natural Capitalism Organization and has done a tremendous amount of work in uh, consulting with businesses, huge corporations in ter um, on sustainability. Anyway, she was asked by uh, one of the interviewers, this same question, what is it that she thought was the most pressing environmental concern that our world faces today? There is Kyle. Go ahead. Come on down, Kyle. Uh, just don't worry about it, Kyle. I've spent time on this campus. It's frustrating and irritating. Um, there's a seat for you right there. Kyle, is, uh, Kyle actually founded Core Capital, and what he is focused on is um, kind of the slow money movement. He and I have done some work together on sustainable investing, so um, should be very interesting. At any rate, um, <clears throat> so I want you to answer this question. It should probably uh, be obvious. I don't know if we're going to close this thing out, but Amory Lovins said, or Hunter Lovins, I'm sorry, she said that the climate change was the number one thing, right? And I see on this we had, what, 54% of you said climate change is the the number one concern. You guys are wrong. And Hunter Lovins is wrong as well. And it's really not her fault and it's not your fault because that is what we've been led to believe. But the reason that she is wrong, first of all, it's an opinion-based question, so it's not really her fault, but that also gives me free reign to tell you what I believe, right? Which is certainly what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna shy away from that. Second of all, she allowed herself to get drawn into a fundamentally flawed question, right? What is the single most pressing issue? That's indicative of the way that we solve problems in the Western Hemisphere, in the Western ideological thought process. We're symptom-oriented, right? We don't attack roots of problems. And we've allowed the profit motive to come in and dictate our approach all too frequently. And if you want a non-sustainability-related example of this, look at the medical industry, right? We spend a lot of time addressing symptoms as opposed to the root of the problem. And we've allowed pharmaceutical companies, for better or for worse, they do some great things, to have undue influence on managing our health, right? So, on that sense, I would say Hunter Lovins is wrong. And what I would like to have seen her, how I would like to have seen her answer that question and how I would have answered that question is, there is no single greatest fear or threat all threats are equal and they're deeply intertwined and we can't adequately address one threat without addressing all of the threats. We need to start thinking differently when we conceptualize sustainability, which is why I believe in addressing uh, sustainability from a comprehensive perspective. And hopefully, as I'll, I'll make, you know, show here in a few minutes, that ethics will help us get there. At any rate, so the next question that I'd like you guys to look at, and you can take your time in answering this, is which component of sustainability holds the most potential in pushing sustainability as a movement? Now, this is going to seem like a trick question, right, <laughs> because of what I just said. We tend to look at sustainability. I'm sure most of you have seen this model. It's a three-part Venn diagram. There's a lot of different uh, ways that we label these categories. I prefer, personally, the equity ecology economy. That's what we use with promoting eco-efficiency. I like to focus on the relationships though, but that ties very nicely in with the people, planet, profit moniker there. So this is something, again, I don't want to go too much into our organization. I want these guys to be able to focus, but we do have a project in Haiti. And when I was flying there this past October to work on this project, I couldn't help but have my mind blown by this particular uh, experience that I had. I thought it was great, you know, sustainably grown coffee served in a styrofoam cup. Now, that should be fundamentally 
obvious why that doesn't make sense. How do we let that happen? How, who, who is responsible for going, yeah, let's put the Rainforest Alliance certified free trade, shade grown, really cool coffee onto a styrofoam cup. Now, we don't need to get into styrofoam and whether it's bad or not. In my mind, it's just like climate change. It's bad, and if someone wants to argue against it, that's for another day, right? But what I do think that would allow us to pull away from this and make it more obvious for people to not see that it's okay to do that is if we had an ethical component brought into the definition of sustainability so that the people making these kinds of decisions, when someone says, yes, okay, this is a sustainable issue that we're trying to do here. This is American Airlines. Somebody there made the decision that said, let's go ahead and put it on the styrofoam cup. I guarantee you because the styrofoam cup is cheaper, right? If they said, okay, from an ethical standpoint, it doesn't make any sense, perhaps we then would see them using a different type of cup, which probably wouldn't cut into their overall profits all that much. But there's value. There's value in doing the right thing. There's branding value. I think we all know this, and some of the panelists will talk about that. If we have a comprehensive view that incorporates, incorporates ethics, we'll start to see that. Now, this particular example, in my mind, is a result of confusing corporate social responsibility with sustainability. Those are two different things that are all too often used interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. Corporate social responsibility can end up like this, where it's just a logo stuck on a styrofoam cup to make people feel good. It's not about the fundamental practices that drive the way people do business, and that's what sustainability needs to be about. <clears throat> Sticking with the consumer wear goods, just to kind of maintain a, uh, a level of consistency here, my nonprofit, we do uh, the sustainability consulting for Omega events, and they throw a number of large festivals. This photograph here is taken from the Doheny Blues Festival, which had 20,000 people. And um, this is the, probably the most visible thing that we do, but it's probably the least impactful. Uh, and that's sorting all of the waste into three different containers. We want to keep recyclables away from uh, landfill and then compost away from landfill as well. Now, most of you have seen, I'm sure, uh, compostable cups and plates and forks and things like that. Has anyone not seen that? That's good. See, I learned how to ask questions <laughs> to get the response I want. Well, <laughs> first of all, let's ignore the fact that most of compostable containers are made out of GMO corn. Obviously, that's an issue. Again, I would put GMO uh, goods right in there with, with styrofoam and climate change. But again, another uh, issue. Um, compostable serviceware is more expensive, right? So we need to find the value. That's why the American Airlines has chosen to use styrofoam cups to serve their rain tree certified or rain forest certified coffee as opposed to something um, more environmentally friendly. However, it is a response to consumer demand, right? Consumers have said that they want to, uh, they want to see things that make them feel better about their consumption. <coughs> the unfortunate thing is, is that what we learned is that these compostable cups in Orange County are basically impossible to compost. And that is very frustrating from my perspective. When I sell our services to an organization like Omega Events, and we have 20,000 people there watching us do um, sustainability practices, and then I learn and find out that really, it was, I'm going to go ahead and say it's a sham, it kind of ticks me off. You know, it ticks me off from my idealistic perspective and, hey, wait a minute, as a consumer, I'm being duped. But it also makes me look stupid, right? You know, here we are getting volunteers through Omega events to be able to sort compostable serviceware into the compost and it doesn't even get composted. To add insult to injury, not only does it not get composted, it probably isn't even getting recycled. Now compostable plastics, it's a number seven plastic and there's very small market for it in the United States. So when I took it to Rainbow Recycling and we had a big long hoo-ha over this, I found out that they could take it but they would recycle it but in order to do so it would get shipped to China. None of that is sustainable in my mind. Now, maybe it gets us looking down the road, right? But it tells me that we need to manage our innovation and we need to manage our ethics. Now, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say it's an easy task. It's very difficult to take all of these different things and, and jumble them up together and then you know, expect here's the equation and, and be able to take care of business, right? It's hard. But 
that's not an excuse not to address these issues and that's what I find happening all too often when I work with businesses is I don't want to do that it's messy it's difficult the metrics are too difficult to incorporate so in answering question number two do we have the answers on that faith um, you know which component is uh, yeah well <laughs> you guys answered it right you know so 76 percent went with D which is kind of what I expected right they're all equal can we take that off so just to kind of remind us okay cool right um, you know there's no right or wrong answer here again but I would argue actually that it's the equity component and I understand why you would put they're all equal because I kind of duped you with the first question right you know but at the same point in time I do think that this is this is why I put that model out not this model but the our, our sustained our standard three-part Venn diagram because it shows balance right and we do need to achieve a balance. But I like this model too. This is a great model. Here we see the, uh, the people component it resides wholly within the planet component, which makes sense. There's no people yet permanently living outside of off Earth that uh, impacts us in any way, shape, or form. Although I did just read an article about uh, populating Mars the other day, which seemed ridiculous. And then economy falls within society, right? It's a component of society. Well, if we want to focus on the profit part of people planet profit or the economic part of a three part Venn diagram we're gonna fail to address a lot of fundamental needs we're already doing that I, sh I don't even need to give you examples right we look around the world we see civil conflict because of in disproportionate economic distribution we see forced migration we see pandemics all the things that I know professor Matthews talked to you about ad nauseum right if we just look at maintaining an environmental integrity well then we forget that there are people that need to survive and they need to live off of what it is that we extract I've worked in several places where indigenous people have been pushed off of national park land and we think great environmental or environmental uh, conservation but the people aren't brought into that equation it's difficult I don't expect again um, for us to solve these problems tonight uh, these are things I grapple with. I literally lose sleep over this. It's irritating because I like to sleep. But I think it's important, and I think that we ignore this all too often in the sustainability movement. Now, what I think is great about these panelists here is that they understand that these are, imp are important issues, and they understand that it's not going to be taken, that we're not going to fix these problems overnight. So this is question three. There's no time limit on this, and I'm not going to come back with an answer on this one, I promise you. I am curious, though, what people think. And don't feel the need to answer this question right now. Okay, I want you to listen to what these guys have to say. But we have, there's several different sectors that we can look at in terms of being the driving force behind the sustainability movement. Right now, I would say business is the strongest force driving the sustainability movement, which is unfortunate because there are some other sectors that are extremely important to this process. I look around for academic jobs. I do want to find my dream academic job, and I can't because most of the academic programs that address sustainability focus on energy savings, water conservation, LEED, AP, all those things that Mo is awesome at, and I know that the Sustainability Council people are very adept at. And they're important, but they don't define the movement, right? Nonprofit organizations should have a lot more influence than they do. My personal opinion is government should just kind of be off to the side, but that's just me. Um, and the open market, I don't know if it's open market, free market, whatever it is, the marketplace, you and I individually, what is our role? That I think is incredibly important. And what I find is that managing ethics and innovation is very difficult, like I think I've already said. It's not easy by any means. Very few organizations have a vested interest in addressing this holistically, right? It's a messy process. There's a lot of metrics that are difficult to quantify. We might have to qualify them, qualitative research. I believe in it. A lot of people don't. It's difficult to assess the different types of value. That's really a key fundamental component, finding value, branding. And all of our motives are very disparate. So that's my perspective. Hopefully I didn't talk too long. I probably did. Um, but I'd like to turn it over right now. Why don't we just start over and just kind of go the end, start with Mo, and then just sort of work this way. Um, it's actually a pleasure to be here and speak in front of you guys. I mean, I have uh, uh, two degrees from, from San Diego State University. It's kind of nice to come up and speak to the college crowd. 
Um, what I do is I do sustainability consulting and construction and remodeling for existing and new, new structures. So we basically go into a business and we look at their operations. We, we just kind of come with a down to the top down view. We take a look at how they're you know, spending their money on their electricity, on their, uh, their lighting, um, their materials. We kind of do a total analysis and then we create a game plan for them to move forward from a baseline which you know, they may be spending, let's say, $20,000 a month on electricity. If you look at, look at a place like this, I mean, these lights are on, it's costing money, they're always cranking. There's a power plant somewhere that's generating this power, that's producing pollution. So if we could reduce the light levels here, we'll actually reduce pollution and save the owner um, a few uh, dollars, right? So we kind of put that on paper. And for an owner, if, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. Um, unfortunately, well, or fortunately. Um, you can talk about green or sustainability all day, but if you're not showing them how they can make money or save money, then they may not listen to you. So you have to lead with, we're going to reduce your cost and you're going to be green, you're going to be sustainable, and then you can reach out to your clients and say, look, here, we're actually a green company, we're sustainable, and here's the things we're doing, and you have to measure it. If you don't measure it, then there's no real value. How are, if people come in and take a look at your operation, they're not going to know that this, how much energy is this, is this owner saving, right? But I kind of want to move back a little bit from that and what kind of touch up on what Jesse was saying in terms of people and planet and, and, and profits, kind of separating the two or bringing them all together. In, in, in this society, in this world, we have a kind of a linear paradigm between, you know, left and right. We're always classifying people between, you know, liberal, conservative, and we always put people in boxes. So. In essence, the, the playing field is kind of drawn, and then, and then people are kind of placed in these, in these categories, right? And, um, and so sustainability could potentially be placed in that linear spectrum, right? So, um, so sustainability will be looked at as a liberal or a, you know, uh, a progressive approach, so it's going to be left of, of the spectrum. And then so people on the right may not pay attention to it. As soon as you say sustainability or green, they're going to be like, oh, that's liberal stuff. We don't want to pay attention to that. So. So we have to think about that as we're moving forward. And uh, mentally, I've taken that paradigm and just destroyed it. I'm, it's not even in my head. So um, I don't want to think along that line. I don't want to put people in, in a linear continuum. So I think if we can look at people as people and the pr planet as an ecosystem and business is part of that, that's how we conduct relationships. It's, it's through business. Then we can actually start moving forward as a society and stop having this divide and conquer um, policy and start focusing on healing the planet rather than having this combative business-based system that um, is really causing maybe more harm than good right now. So um, sustainability to me is that, is actually creating a holistic business-based system where you can profit. There's nothing wrong with making money, but at the same time, not compromising those values and ethics to get there. So um, that's one reason why a lot of us are against uh, the 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 fossil fuel industries and, and what how that has come to play over time. It's not really a sustainable system. Um, it's a finite resource. So if the more we can cut that down, the better, and then start transitioning away from that. So we've got over, what, over 100 years of post-industrial or industrial um, uh, infrastructure in place. It's not going to happen overnight. So you know we need to keep going, keep moving forward, work on existing buildings like this, reduce their energy, uh, reduce pollution, reduce waste, and um, just kind of uh, start taking it forward. That's kind of the philosophy we take. And then we, you know, we run our business. We have to work within certain, um, uh, I guess, the Cal well, let me use this as an example. The California Green Building Code right now is in effect. So the government is actually taking some steps moving forward. But we have to be careful that sustainability does not become too overly regulated to the point where it actually shoots itself in the foot. So. Um, that's kind of a, a tough, a tough a balancing act, but there is a California Green Building Code that actually requires new buildings to be built green. So you actually reuse, so if you, if you knock down these walls, you're actually going to reuse parts of the building. Um, you're going to reuse the beams, you're going to reuse the lights and, and, um, and everything. So we actually helped a client save $8,000 on a construction project where we actually reused the insulation, the metal beams, and some of the flooring. So. Um, we even brought in natural light. So if you can bring in natural light, you've got these windows over here. The light comes in, and you actually can operate or function without turning on the lights. So um, if a building can use natural light, then that's great. And that's, part, that's a green building feature, and the state is requiring that now. So that's a good thing. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, 
I think that's a, that's about it. I can't really think of anything else. But if there's if there's any questions, just raise your hand and ask. So that you don't have to wait. Good evening, and uh, thank you, Jesse, for letting us participate. Um, what uh, what? Well, I'm going to talk about innovation. Michael talk about ethics. Kind of three main topics I want to touch on. Uh, our, our company and our approach, and quite a few similarities to what Mo is doing. Uh, talk about sustainability as a mega trend, and Justin, you touched on this in your, your intro. And, and then talk uh, about one of the processes that we use with our clients uh, to uh, frame the discussion, and it's a very kind of a high level approach. Um, so, so our company, uh, uh, five partners, we all have uh, a related background uh, to sustainability with, uh, with expertise in renewables, um, waste minimization, energy efficiency, uh, and the built environment. And um, uh, we, uh, we're all about helping our clients identify opportunities for competitive advantage uh, by applying sustainability concepts to their strategic plans, their supply chain, their operations, uh, and their product development. So, um, so how do we do it? Well, we start with uh, diagnostic tools, uh, environmental audits, uh, as Mo had suggested, uh, energy, uh, water consumption, waste minimization, look at their transportation, uh, use carbon footprint calculators, and life cycle assessments, which, uh, which maybe uh, perhaps uh, you're, you're familiar with. But the whole purpose here is to establish baselines uh, and quantify the environmental impacts. Um, so again, we're looking at their, their supply chain, their operations and workplaces, uh, product use and product end of life uh, to, to determine both direct and the implied environmental impacts. Uh, then we develop initiatives that will either reduce the cost or provide the company with competitive advantage uh, while at the same time reducing environmental impacts or, or waste. So um, a, an example, if you look at the life cycle assessment of an iPod, uh, you'll find that 47% of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions occur uh, in consumer use. And so uh, a recommendation that we made to one of our clients is to uh, do a promotion where you're, you're uh, asking people to use a solar charger and, and just take take that whole charging of the iPod kind of off the grid. So um, another another example is uh, if you look at the carbon footprint of hotels or hospitals, you'll find 20% of their carbon footprint has to do with heating water for domestic uses. So if you can uh, bring in a, a solar thermal system, uh, some of them are capable of reducing that that demand by 50% which is a significant reduction in the carbon footprint for the facility. Um, talking a little bit about uh, sustainability then as a megatrend uh, from a business perspective, but we see it as a megatrend, a, a new frontier for innovation. Uh, there are a number of, uh, uh, the number of producers and consumers of goods and services will, will actually triple uh, in the next 20 years, uh, which is gonna put uh, significantly increased pressure on our natural resources and on our environment. And so uh, in response to this, many traditional approaches to businesses will, will fail. Uh, insurgent companies with disruptive technologies are going to displace the industry incumbents, uh, and entirely new industries will be formed as the early movers embrace sustainability as, as innovation's new frontier. So. Uh, Definitely, this qualifies as a, as a megatrend, as, uh, as defined by uh, uh, John uh, Nesbitt, and, and uh, as Jesse had mentioned, uh, the technology movement was definitely one of these megatrends, as was the quality movement. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll recognize the impact that uh, the, the Japanese automotive industry had on the U.S. automotive industry, and that was all due to quality and without bailouts. Or our American, most of our American automotive industry would, would uh, no longer be around. So um, um, we define the megatrend as an inescapable strategic imperative. Uh, 
a persistent change in the business environment that allows insurgents and or companies with disruptive technologies to unseat the incumbents. We, we recognize this, or the evidence of this, uh, is that companies must increasingly internalize what they have historically been, what have historically been externalities. And I assume you're familiar with that term. Um, it, evidence, uh, recent SEC ruling that climate risk, uh, CO2 emissions, and water use are material to companies' financial earnings. Uh, and recent regulation uh, by the EPA of greenhouse gases as pollutants. So you also see thousands of companies investing actually trillions of dollars on sustainable innovations, 3.3 uh, trillion invested since 2007. So last topic, uh, I want to look at one of our processes that we use for helping companies to identify opportunities for innovation. It's a case study approach where we look at successes uh, other companies have, uh, uh, have used to, and then we apply those same concepts to our clients' products and services. And this is all based on lessons learned from previous megatrends. So at the, at the kind of the, the shallowest level, if you will, companies can, can use sustainability or a sustainable approach to their business uh, just to reduce cost. This is the, the low-hanging fruit. This is what, we'll, uh, what you'll identify by doing energy audits and, and uh, water efficiency audits and this kind of thing. Um, opportunity here to also uh, reduce risk. Uh, and perhaps go beyond compliance, as uh, Hewlett Packard did, uh, got led out of their uh, electronic, uh, electronic equipment long before that was required so that they could avoid any interruptions to their operations. Um, at the next level, you can, you can talk about redesigning products, processes, and business functions to optimize efficiencies and re uh, reduce resource utilization. Example here, uh, Procter & Gamble uh, put a lot of effort in 2005 into developing cold water laundry detergents uh, after recognizing that 3% of household budgets were going to heat water to wash clothes. And especially in the EU, uh, they've had tremendous success in marketing the cold water detergents. Doesn't seem significant, but uh, they've, they've documented the saving uh, saving 34 million tons of CO2 emissions annually through the use of, of their cold water detergents. So going one level deeper, you can look at transforming your core business, uh, where sustainable innovation uh, becomes a source of new revenue and growth for your company, uh, where you can impart disruptive green innovation. Um, an example, kind of a poster child from my perspective, is Interface Carpet Company. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with that story, but uh, uh, the, the founder, Ray Anderson, kind of had an epiphany by reading Hawkins' book back in 1995, uh, uh, Ecology of Commerce. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, and uh, so through establishment of their mission zero, zero waste, zero carbon, zero emissions by, 2000, uh, by 2020, uh, a number of uh, pretty amazing innovations came out of that, uh, out of that epiphany and that uh, resetting as far as the priorities for that company. So um, one of those being selenium carpet, which was the first completely recyclable carpet made of completely recyclable materials. Uh, their cool carpet product, which <coughs> is made with 100% renewable energy and also is completely recyclable. Uh, they also developed tactiles, uh, which has uh, enabled them to largely eliminate the use of uh, the adhesives, and that was an innovation based on biomimicry. Um, so uh, the results uh, were been very significant, obviously, for, uh, for Interface, a billion dollar company. Uh, it's really excelled through by, by embracing sustainability at this transformative level. Uh, then probably at the deepest level or an even deeper level, you, you look at creating new business models entirely to differentiate your brand. 
uh, examples uh, being GE Eco Imagination. Uh, all of the businesses that are in the GE Eco Imagination group are refurbishment businesses. So they're, they have their products in a cycle uh, as opposed to a value chain. So no longer take make waste. Now all these products are in, the, in a value cycle. Uh, and the Eco Imagination line is responsible for about $20 billion of, uh, of GE's business. Um, and, uh, and it's growing faster than, than most of their other business lines. Uh, another example would be Clorox Greenworks, where a $20 million investment in, uh, in 2005 <coughs> to develop the, the natural ingredient-based cleansers uh, has resulted in a, what is now a billion dollar business line for, uh, for Clorox. So um, just kind of a wrap up uh, statement that I've blown way past my time, I'm sure. Uh, traditional cost benefit analysis is gonna miss uh, intangible benefits such as avoiding accidents, protecting reputation, building goodwill with consumers and communities. Uh, it will also miss intangible liabilities uh, and environmental damage, uh, so all the externalities. So if, if companies, uh, they need to rethink their typical hurdle rate uh, approach to investment decision making, uh, and if they value the intangibles and the externalities appropriately, they will end up making the right decisions. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mike. Okay. So it's your uh, guys' last day of class. Huh? Do you guys have to come back for finals? Oh, yes, no? I, well, one more. <laughs> I'll leave that alone. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I just wanted to touch, talk a little bit about ethics and uh, sustainability ethics, and then I'll kind of wrap it up with some opinions and recommendations. So first, just to kind of paint a, a framework of what ethics is, wh where does it come from? What does it mean? It, it means different things to different people. So I'll, I'm going to combine a traditional definition along with my personal definition of what I think ethics means and maybe something that you can take from it. Um, again, ethics means different things to different people and uh, we all face many different ethical issues in our life, you know, ranging from abortion, uh, stem cell research, uh, cyber porn, uh, in, in performance enhancing drugs. These are just some of the issues that, uh, that, that all of us face as, as a society and as, a, as individuals. But it all starts individually from our principles and values. So principles and values are our individual fundamental beliefs of what is right and what is wrong, what, what is good, what is just, what is fair. So that starts with the individual. And morals is our principles and values that we assign to a system of our beliefs. And that can stem from religious, political, our upbringing, so it all starts with principles and values, and then it rolls up into a moral belief or position, and then how we act on those morals it, it determines our ethical position at, at, at an impasse. So it, in one example to illustrate is if, if you, a defense attorney, a defense attorney defending a client accused of murder who knows the client has committed murder, believes that morally that murder is wrong, it's, that murder is immoral. However, the defense attorney has an ethical obligation to defend that client as rigorously as possible. So the lesson is that that's a situation where morals and ethics collide. And I think we can all relate to that. So that's just an, an illustration to discern between morals and ethics, but it all starts from our principles and values. So if we look at sustainability ethics, sustainability ethics was born out of environmental ethics. And environmental ethics is basically a response to evidence of environmental degradation that our behavior is unsustainable and hence arises the moral issue and that is our false dichotomy between human and the rest of nature. And I'm sure you guys have talked about this before. Sustainable development is the ability to meet our present needs without compromising the ability to meet our future uh, generations to meet their needs. And when we refer to sustainable development, we need to define what is to be sustained and by whom and for how long. Who gets to make that decision? Who, who's the high moral authority that gets to decide that? Is it Al Gore? 
But I don't know. But these are just things to think about. Uh, we have to start appreciating the, the scale of the challenges that we face. And in my opinion, changing a light bulb or a recycling program is not sustainability. That's just one grain of sand in the bowl of sand. But it's a start. And, and, it's, and it's a position and it's a mentality. But it's not sustainability. Um, we have to stop displacing the problems and projecting them into the future. We have to stop kicking the can down the road. And we have to deal with them now because if we don't deal with them now, you, like the old mantra, you, you pay me now or pay me ten times more later. And also currently among 18 to 25 year olds, there, there really is no demand for sustainability or alternative forms of energy or conservation to any large scale in, in my opinion. And I think that's another uh, issue that you should be aware of. And when we think about our relationship with respect to sustainability from a social, economic, and environmental perspective, the three pillars of sustainability, I, I think there's a fourth one. And I think the fourth one is really the engine that drives it. And that's culture. Because you can have the best sustainability program or initiative ever conceived by man, but without that cultural engine, it's not going to work. So I think there's a fourth component, and that's culture. I think that's really important. As, as you embrace sustainability, you're going to have tough moral questions to face going forward. And another area of sustainability ethics that I want to touch upon, which you may, be, may or may not be aware of, and that's the term greenwashing. I'm sure most of you have heard that term before. Uh, I think even Jesse had alluded to some situations or scenarios where, um, w w that will apply to greenwashing. Uh, greenwashing, a traditional definition, is the practice of making an unsubstantiated or misleading claim about the environmental benefits of a product, service, or tech, uh, technology. Some of the greenwashing sins you should be aware of is hidden trade-offs, uh, lack of proof, uh, vagueness, irrelevance, lying, flat-out categorical lying. It's what I call gaming the system, right? So a couple of examples is about a week ago I was driving in Orange County and I saw a Hummer. And a Hummer is one of the most non-environmentally friendly vehicles on the road. And there's nothing wrong with owning a Hummer. You should be able to own one if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. But on the Hummer, there was EcoStar paintings and leaves. And this guy was promoting his business as environmentally friendly. It was a service business. I don't remember what it was. But he's on a Hummer. So I, I thought, wow, I, 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 that just struck me as uh, peculiar. I'm not sure w what his intent was there. Uh, another one is the auto executives that showed up to Washington, D.C. a few years ago asking for bailout money. They showed up on their corporate jet, w which is fine. There's really nothing wrong with that. However, the next time they showed up to the meeting, they showed up in hybrid vehicles. So it's a bit disingenuous, in my opinion. It's a form of greenwashing. Some of the solutions to greenwashing is using third-party verification, uh, ANSI accreditation, American National Standards Institute, following some, following some kind of protocol or procedure, and also transparency. Currently, we consume natural resources faster than we can replenish them. And an ethical approach to sustainability suggests that as a society and as individuals, we have a moral obligation to restrain wasteful uses of resources. I think we can all agree with that. And how do we do that? Well, your challenge is going forward is how can you integrate engineering, science, economics, and public policy to address sustainability on a, on a global scale? These are things that you have to think about and that you have to ask yourself. What is your role going forward? And um, also remember sustainability, in my opinion, some people will disagree, but in my opinion, sustainability is not a destination. Um, in my opinion, it, it's a way of traveling. And along the, the path or the journey of in sustainability, you're going to have benchmarks and successes, but it, it's a continuum. Sustainability is a continuum. It's never a place of arrival. It, it's, it's fluid. It's dynamic. It's constantly evolving and changing. So I, I would implore that you uh, keep that in mind. And to, to kind of sum it up, I'll share with you a, a quote that's always resonated with me personally as a father, a husband. Uh, as a military leader, as a sustainability professional and engineer, and that is that you know, it, the, the world as we know it will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch 
without doing anything. That was a quote from Albert Einstein. And that same analogy applies to sustainability. And our inability to sustain ourselves will not culminate by inaction of those who fail to embrace sustainability, but rather by those who bystand without doing anything. And we can't do it alone. And hence, the fourth pillar of sustainability, in my opinion, is culture. Aside from the socioeconomic and environmental, it's culture. That's the key. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we tonight? Last day of school, huh? Who here is excited? Raise your hand, please. Yeah, buddy. Um, some more questions for you. Um, I'm a chef. My name is Matthew Perez. I work here locally in Orange County. Um, work with Jesse on a couple other programs that I'll be talking about here in just a little bit. But a couple of questions in preparation for this. Um, you know, I wanted to say something that was engaging. I wanted for to challenge myself for one word. If I was going to do one thing tonight, what would it be? And that's going to be inspiration. I'm going to try to inspire you over the next 10 minutes. So hopefully I'm successful. And if I'm not, please don't throw stones at me. <laughs> By a show of hands, who here lives on a farm? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. How about your parents? Who here has had parents that have lived on a farm? Good. A few hands. How about your grandparents? Okay. The progression of hands that go up, okay, on those who lived on a farm. You would assume if you live on a farm, you know how to cultivate produce, kill chickens, feed yourself, right? I'm sure a lot of you studious minds have heard the Mayan prophecy predicts this is the last year of your life, okay? December 21st, I was supposed to go up. What's going to happen if a solar flare does come and all the electricity and the entire grid is wiped out? Everything, all the conveniences that you're used to over-consuming are gone. Who here by a show of hands feels confident that they'd be able to find some dirt and plant some vegetables and be able to feed themselves? Pretty good. I would love to see everybody's hand go up. Um, working in a kitchen over the last 13 years, I've been an executive chef and a partner for this restaurant group that I'm currently working for. And... I'm very passionate about what I do. I've seen a lot of trends happen ever since I started, left culinary school, started out thinking I knew something, met a few chefs, realized I didn't know what I was talking about, then thought I knew something again, then became humble. Um, food brings us all together. Who here for Turkey Day, Christmas, if you celebrate that, goes home, you travel to see your family, right? The coolest thing is, is sitting down at that dining room table and congregating with your family, talking about life, how are things going, catching up. That food brings people together. It's one of the most genuine things you can do is get together with your friends or family, have a glass of wine, have some good food, talk. It's one of the most genuine things there are to do out there other than love somebody. In that, the questions I asked you earlier about living on a farm is that as a chef, some of the most recent trends that are kind of a bummer is that we get our food from so far away. A lot of chefs here locally in Orange County, they have farmers, uh, local dairy farms, farms that raise chickens, local aqua farms here from Carlsbad that don't even know they exist. They still happily pay $2 more per pound for some green-lit mussels that get on a jet all the way from New Zealand to come here so that on one Saturday night you take out your gal, she's dressed nice, you feel good, you go out and eat some green-lit mussels, not even knowing that that's spent hours and hours and hours on a plane. So in the inspiration that I talked about earlier, <coughs> this is all happening on our watch. All of you studious minds out there are about to set yourself free into this world, choose a career, decide what you want to do or not want to do. I encourage all of you to ask more questions. Who here has had a Rebel or a five hour energy drink today? A couple hands, huh, right? We've become this genre of consumers and in often cases, over consumers, okay? Some of the things are so in the mainstream that we can't help it. They're basically marketing it to us in such a fashion that you almost can't say no. 
I need to go fast. I need two Red Bulls, 24 ounce, 40 ounce. Did it make it any bigger? You know? In that, really, really challenge yourself to ask questions. Where does your food come from? Talking about fish. There is a movie that's out that I encourage you to watch over the summer when you're sitting around with nothing to do. It's called The End of the Line. It's narrated by Ted Danson. And it's one of the most striking movies you'll ever see, apart from Food, Inc., about where your food comes from. By 2048, a lot of smart minds in the world, including the EU, predicted that by 2048, most of the large fish that you would know if I asked you would collapse. Gone. No longer. Bluefin tuna, the most prestigious large water fish in the whole world, is on the brink of collapse. And a lot of people don't even know that. A lot of people will go into a restaurant and not feel comfortable or familiar on what fish is being overcaught, overfished, where does it come from. These are all great questions that I'd love to inspire you to take with you. Let's all, as I hinted, to, this is on our watch. It's all happening right now. So if I have kids, I need your help. Okay? I'm genuinely asking for it because one day they're not going to be able to see bluefin tuna or yellowfin tuna or take your pick. Imagine that. You can all think back to when we had to put a cassette player in your car. How cool is that, huh? Then a CD. What is a CD? Right? Those are things that we live through. But it's a bummer when you can say, oh, son, I used to fix this for your mother for dinner on Thursday nights, but there's no such thing as mahi-mahi anymore. So in that inspiration, um, thank you for allowing me to come and speak to you. But please take that with you. Ask questions on where your food comes from. Educate yourself. Inspire those around you to want to know more about the food that you consume. Jesse and I, we started a group here locally that we can do a little Q&A at the end, but it's called the Positive Plate. And we basically created a group out of uh, pure passion to want to inspire those restaurateurs, business owners, resort owners, hoteliers, to want to do a better job, to want to ask better questions on where things come from. And once they do a fantastic job, we're going to come in and put this completely renewable bamboo board on their wall that says, I'm the bee's knees. I'm trying. I may not be doing everything, but at least I'm raising my hand saying, I'll help if I can. So please raise your hand and say, I'll help if I can. Thank you.